Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this is, um, ah, I see Steph Callums is just of the old current crew has just entered as well. And I think Alice is here. So um, this is uh, the very first uh, program in the second year of the current Zoomcast. Somehow have made it into a second year, which is uh, something. Um, so, and I'm pleased to say we have a, a new uh, group of students who are helping out and, and with programming and running um, current uh, for this year. And I would say they are very open to if people have anyone here on the call or has ideas about people they'd like to invite on or um, items they'd like to include, discussions they'd like to have. We're very open um, to all of that. Um, as you know, uh, the format is that we usually run once maybe twice a week uh, at lunch times it's quite informal and we'd have one or two items um and um i think it's kind of appropriate actually today that we kick off um the 21 22 current season with a, a talk by mark price who was actually part of the very first current i'd say probably about a year ago right about today um so it's great to have mark with us mark has been teaching a little bit less now in the current year, but certainly has been a sort of a stalwart of the um, School of Architecture Planning Environmental Policy in UCD for years and years, um, and has been really instrumental um, in a lot of um, students' education in terms of both how they think about architecture and how they represent architecture and how they design and how they operate as well as the world. Um, so without further ado, Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, as people may know, um, in UCD at the moment, um, we are working on a project across years one to four of the program, which is looking at the GPO and its environs. So not only is Mark being our first guest appropriate, but his those is also highly appropriate. Uh, Mark, over to you. At the moment, there's been a little bit of interference. It may be somebody, yeah, who needs to mute. But if I can ask everyone if they're, if they're not automatically muted, if you can mute when, you, when you're coming in. So, Mark, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, you. And so, obviously, somebody say to me, if you can't see anything or if you can't hear anything, just let me know. So I'm going to talk about... Um, your no, Riley... no. Is that somebody asking me to speak louder? No, it's somebody who's not muted. We 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 will we're gonna to have to get the settings for the next time right in terms of people being automatically muted when they enter. So, so I'm just um, no worries. So uh O'Rahilly was my great grandfather who fought in the in the um sixteen rising. And I want to talk about the GPO. Uh oh dear. Oh dear. Yes. So uh the first question might be what about the what's the 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 all about? Um it's um, probably sounds a little um, weird to be calling yourself the anything. Um, and it was probably <clears throat> a joke um, because he was a Grail Gore. Um, Yeats granted it, granted it to him. He said, sing of the Arahali, do not deny his right, sing a the before his name. Allow that he, despite all those learned historians, established it for good. He wrote out that word himself. He christ christened himself with blood, how goes the weather? So uh, it might have been just a joke, but it became, um, kind of justified. And then the second related subject, which is the building students are studying um, where O'Rahilly spent the last week of his life, um, which I think is the most famous building in Ireland. Um, and it's because of the 1916 rising. And the question I have is, is there anything um, architectural about that fame? Um, anything that isn't anything which is purely architectural about its fame from the 1916 rising. So Nelson Goodman, for instance, says, even when a building does not mean something, um, that even when a building does mean something, that may have nothing to do with its architecture. A building may come to stand for some of its causes or effects or for some historical event that occurred on its site to mean in such a way as not thereby to function as an architectural work. So is there anything about it's 1916 fame, which is architectural. And I, at the end of the lecture, will hopefully propose that there is. So um, the background to this story is um, the, the following. If we think about Ireland and, and centuries of domination by the British, uh, we think generally about a small group of uh, Protestant um, exploiters, if you like, 
uh, English or Anglo-Irish, and then a much larger group of impoverished Catholic natives starving often. And that's a useful model in many ways, but in the 19th century, um, a significant class of prosperous Catholic Irish people emerged, particularly in the south and east of the country. And a rally was uh, typical in, in some ways of the merchant class that grew on top of this agricultural base. This was their uh, shop and pub um, in Ballylongford and Kerry. And it enabled O'Reilly to live a very um, comfortable lifestyle. He lived in uh, Balls Bridge in Herbert Park. He had five, he had five sons, three of them here. My grandfather is sitting in the front, looking directly at the camera. And he, his wife, who he met in America, he, he drove around in a French car and he indulged or he pursued his interests. I really not see much evidence of him, him having to um, earn a living. Um, and his interest increasingly was Irish cultural nationalism. And so he was involved in the Gaelic League, which was committed to de-Anglicizing Ireland. He designed a typeface, which is sometimes said to be the first modern Gaelic typeface. And increasingly he became interested in politics. So he went to the corporation in advance of King George V's proposed visit and got permission to put up a banner at the top of Grafton Street, and they assumed, presumably because he produced the fee and looked reasonably respectable, that it was going to be some of the usual sycophantic God save the, God save the King stuff. But in fact, this was the banner that he put up. Uh, and of course, the police uh, uh, arrived immediately and removed the pole. So he, he drew this cartoon uh, with, with Countess Markovitz, the DD the run the empire, the capture of the poles. So the background to all of this is that the famine decimated Irish agricultural society. Um, th two, uh, three quarters of landless labourers um, disappeared between 1840 and 1890. Um, two million people, one million immediately killed, died, another million fled. Um, but what was left was a class of tenant farmers. And there was a tradition of Fenian uh, rebellion against the British. And this had been driven underground in the 19th century. Um, but this particular Fenian turned his attention to land agitation, to seeking to get these tenant farmers more land. And he formed an unlikely alliance with this man who had started a thing called the Home Rule League. Parnell had started this Home Rule group. He, it was an unlikely alliance because David was from a very different class and a very different orientation, much more, if you like, he had been a Fenian uh, and he was from, well, this man was much more what we consider high haute bourgeois uh, Irish professional, that other class that had emerged in the 19th century. And this marriage, if you like, between the two was officiated by the Catholic church who, who brought them together. The British establishment had their own agenda and it was a move by the ruling elites against the landed aristocracy, which corresponded to the move from agricultural to industrial capital in England in the 19th century. And um, basically this came to a head of the corn law disputes at the beginning of the century. The industrial uh, leaders wanted cheap food. The traditional landowners wanted to keep the price of food up, but the move against the aristocrats resulted also in redistributions of land in Ireland. This meant that the Land League, which had been formed by David, uh, joining with Parnell's Home Rule Party, became enormously successful. Uh, Parnell fell out of the church through a scandal and was replaced by John Redmond. And by the turn of the century, by 1900, you could say that Ireland was a one-party state. The Irish party, the Irish Parliamentary Party in Westminster, um, led by John Redmond. For example, in the 1910 election, uh, two thirds of the candidates were returned unopposed. Um, Conor Cruz O'Brien has this, that the Irish party was one of the first modern political parties which required candidates to promise to vote with the party, like a whip, uh, and paid MPs from party funds to enable middle-class candidates to run for office, decades before the introduction uh, of exchequer funded salaries. Um, so. This massively successful party was not 
to everyone's taste. And this man here was particularly exercised. He had been in Trinity with John Redmond um, and also, by the way, with Oscar Wilde, who he became famous as the barrister who attacked and destroyed Wilde in the court cases around the libel suit. When Wilde heard that Carson was going to be prosecuting him, prosecuting him, he said that he was sure he would uh, pursue the case with all the added bitterness of an old friend. So what happened was in 1911, the Liberal Party in England, in London, wanted to get an act. They couldn't get their, their legislation passed, the Tories in the House of Lords. So they managed to get an act through removing the veto from the House of Lords, relying on the Irish Party. The Irish Party held the balance of power in Westminster because of their power. By the way, I didn't mention that the vast amount of money they had came from the Land League. It was basically a huge subscription system. Uh, and in return for supporting the Liberals in 1911, John Redmond, the leader, got the Home Rule Bill. However, this led to the reaction of Ulster Unionists, stirred up by Carson, uh, who signed the Ulster Covenant um, and vowed to oppose Home Rule, and to the mutiny of officers in the Curra who refused to move against the volunteers. They would arm themselves to resist home rule by all means necessary, quote, the Tories pledged their support to the Unionists. So the Tories in 1912 were standing full square behind the Unionists. If anyone can tell me any change that has occurred in the last hundred years, um, please let me know. My address will be at the end of the lecture. So what happened was the uh, nationalist groups, many of them, and they split from the general home rule movement. And a rally convened a meeting, a meeting um, in November 1930 in response to the formation of the Ulster Volunteers to form the Irish Volunteers, along with Bulmer Hobson, who'd been an IRB, that's a secret underground descendant, if you like, of the Fenians. Um, but all the other people at the meeting, uh, apart from Rahali and Owen McNeil, who was the UCD professor, who was a kind of a cultural nationalist too, um, the, the Unionists brought in guns in Larne in the beginning of 1914 to resist home rule. So O'Reilly uh, organized a shipment of guns that Erskine Childers brought over on his yacht uh, in July of 1914, called the Hoth Gun Running. O'Reilly's car on the way back in from Hoth broke down full of guns and a policeman, it is said, cycling, helped him to get it started. In 1915, um, Redmond, managed to intervene with this entire thing. The Irish volunteers had been mass massively successful, 150,000 people joined. But in 1915, Redmond managed to persuade 140,000 of those to join with the, the imperial war effort. In other words, to go and fight against the Germans on the promise that if they did, the Home Rule Bill would be enacted. The, of course, the, was a terrible tragedy because uh, at least 35,000 Irish deaths in the war. And the conclusion is from this period of history that we must draw is that the Irish party, and this is really something we can think about in our own time, were not unionists, but they were imperialists and that maybe they didn't realize you can't be one and not the other. So the rising then was planned in 1915 and it was predicated on massive support from the Germans. And Roger Casement, an English social justice fighter, an Irish revolutionary, was sailed across with whole consignment of German guns, but was intercepted and arrested on the Friday before the, the planned rising for Easter Sunday, 1916. The, the reason for the date was that the IRB people, along with the Irish Citizens Army of James Connolly, had decided to strike while Britain was in the middle of this war, thinking that the war would end soon, this would be a great time to secure Irish freedom. Um, but when Casement was arrested, uh, the leader of the volunteers, MacNeil, sent out a, a what's known as a counterman countermanding order, which he said that all of the maneuvers of the volunteers for Easter Sunday were going to be rescinded or canceled. No parades, marches, or other movements of Irish volunteers will take place. Um, this caused mass confusion. O'Reilly was on MacNeil's side, not on the side of the IRB. He wasn't in on the secret planning 
uh, of Pierce, Connolly, Clark, and so forth, went off down to Kerry and other parts to relay news of the cancelling of the rising. Um, but, oh, I have to get rid of this, excuse me, uh, so I can read. But um, Pierce and Connolly went ahead anyway. And well, Raleigh came back to Dublin and was woken up by his friend Desmond Fitzgerald who on Monday, morning of Easter Monday, and told that the rising would go ahead, even though he'd been, he didn't, it was just a total shock to him. He got into his car and he drove into Liberty Hall, filled his car with guns and drove around to the GPO. And Yates says, sing of the rally that had such, had such little sense. He told Pierce and Connolly, he'd gone to great expense, keeping all the Kerry men out of that crazy fight, that he might be there himself, he had traveled half the night. How goes the weather? No idea what the, <coughs> how goes the weather is about. Um, Hold on, sorry. Am I such a craven, a craven that I should not get the word, but for what some traveling man had heard, I, I had not heard. Then on Pierce and Connolly, he fixed a bitter look. Because I helped to wind the clock, I came to hear it strike. How goes the weather? So he pulled up at Princess Street, and this was a photograph of his car at the end of the week. In the early, Days, Monday, April the 24th, Tuesday, and most of Wednesday, very little happened. When Connolly and Pierce rushed in at midday on the 24th, this was the scene, the newly renovated main office, customer's office, very few people around. Uh, nobody took it seriously. Everyone thought this was a joke, including apparently some of the volunteers who'd come. They thought it was still a maneuver. So Connolly had to fire a shot. And, and, and Connolly fires a shot. Did you get that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, O'Rahilly, uh, let me see, does anyone see? Uh, they, yeah, Pierce reads the proclamation. O'Rahilly is alleged to have helped a prisoner who was being held in the telephone box. And letters were going in and out, including this one from my grandfather, who was 12. Dear Dada, I got your, now, this, I got your N splotch letter. This is a bullet hole, allegedly. Uh, I heard from Nell and Anno, that's his aunts, that the volunteers are winning. I don't suppose they'll ever get the GPO for as long as you are in command. Father Mahoney told us that up in Portobello Bridge, there were two soldiers killed and 24 wounded. We had Father Mahoney down here last night with Anno and had a great, had a grand talk about the whole thing with blessed love from Aegon. So another thing is that soldier, uh, volunteers on the roof allegedly were board for the first few days taking pot shots at Nelson and meant to have taken off his nose and O'Rahilly went up and told them to stop that. The head came, when they blew the thing up, the head was kept down and kept in a, in a museum. Um, the British on Wednesday produced a gunboat and immediately started shelling Liberty Hall, even though there was nobody in it, but presumably just because it was some class of a socialist activity going on there, had been, but they kept hitting the loop bridge, which you see the shadow of in the front, um, which was kind of comical. Um, but a story from Max Caulfield, uh, I just don't want to lay too much of this, but Max Caulfield, I always thought was the great source of stories from the rising. But um, nowadays you see on the internet, oh, Max Caulfield, maybe entertaining, but probably didn't happen. And I don't see what's wrong with that, because if these things didn't happen, they should have. De Valera was in charge of Boland's mill and got um, one of the, some of the volunteers to run a flag up the chimney, an, an Irish Republican flag. Meanwhile, real artillery was being brought in from Athlone and from Kingston Dunleary. And near Mount Street, where I am now, some, some of the Sherwood foresters saw this flag on Boland's mill and of course thought, oh, we'll, we'll get them there. So they fired a shell which flew, of course, right past the chimney and landed right beside the Helga in the river, who then thought they were under attack from the rebels over at Boland's Bill. So they fired back and, of course, the shell flew right over the chimney and landed right beside the, the British gun. And this went on for a bit, apparently, um, before they realized what was happening. But this is from Max Caulfield. Either way, by the end of the rebellion, by the end of the week, the... <laughs> center of the city was in flames. It had been shelled to pieces and the rebels were facing the end of their occupation of the headquarters in the GPO. Um, you see here this painting from Walter Page, the beginnings of this religious iconography, the 
um, Pieta-like arrangement of Connolly on the stretcher with Winnie Carney, his, his secretary, giving him a glass of water. Uh, the, the gun wound, by the way, should have been in his foot because that's where he was he'd been shot uh, when, he, when he was out. And Pierce looking off into the middle distance, you know, at history, presumably. Um, O'Reilly uh, escaped from the GPO with 14 of the rebels, with the idea was to go and set up another garrison up on what's now Parnell Street. And he was shot, uh, went into a laneway and wrote on the other side of the letter that my grandfather had sent him two days earlier uh, as he was dying. Darling Nancy, I was shot leading a rush up Moore Street, took refuge in a doorway. And these are the bullet holes, allegedly, you see. While I was there, I heard <laughs> the men pointing out where I was and I made it bolt for the lane I am in now. I got more than one bullet, I think. Tons and tons of love, dearie, to you and <laughs> the boys and Nell and Anno. It was a good fight anyway. Please deliver this to Nanny O'Rahilly, 40 Herbert Park, Dublin. Goodbye, darling. Uh, so in 19, or sorry, 2005, my grandfather asked me to get involved in a project to commemorate. And so I worked with Shane Cullen, the artist, to have this letter put up over the spot where he died in what's now O'Rahilly Parade off Moore Street. Uh, some hours after O'Rahilly left the GPO, um, the hundred remaining rebels, Pearson Connolly, some, so, some prisoners, worked their way out of onto Henry Street, down Henry Place. O'Rahilly had shown the unwisdom of using the normal route down Moore Street. So they went up onto the first floor, number 10, and burrowed their way through the party walls all the way down to number 16, where the following day, they decided to surrender. Pierce Connolly wrote, in order to prevent further slaughter of Dublin citizens and in the hope of saving the lives of our followers now surrounded, the members of the provisional government present, present at headquarters have agreed to an unconditional surrender. This famous photograph of Pierce on the other side of him, you can just see the skirt underneath is Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell, who was then given the job of conveying this surrender to all the different garrisons around the city. A wonderful account if you get a chance to read it. The city centre devastated from the bombardment, from the shelling, from the officers on top of Trinity College, from the Helga. Uh, this led to the execution of the leaders and some others and to a revolution that happened in Ireland between around 1918 and 1923. This basically the Irish party who had been, as I said earlier, more or less dominant in Irish society, completely vanished from the scene. And Sinn Féin were massively returned in an illegal election in 1918. All over the country, people stopped cooperating with the police. The RIC, as they were called, had to abandon their barracks. Uh, the British sent over a group called the Black and Tans and another group called the Auxiliaries, which made matters much worse, turned the whole thing into a battle between the authorities and the people. In other words, the state had completely lost the confidence of the people. Strikes all over the country, including a Soviet in Limerick, a general strike in Dublin in support of prisoners in 1920. And behind it all, the IRA, if you like, Michael Collins, uh, conducting a low intensity but vicious attack on the institutions uh, of the state. And this was, I'm featuring all of the buildings in this lecture, but I'll talk more about this one again, but including the um, demolition of the customs house, which was the conspiracy to destroy of which was hatched in O'Reilly's house in Herbert Park. And this is my cousin pointing to the house in case you're wondering what is the subject of the photograph. Um, and this house, as you probably know, was knocked down recently by a developer. Um, I'm not saying that it was in retribution uh, by some universal law of karma for the plot to destroy the customs house. So when this revolution ended in a truce in 1921, um, a treaty was signed between the IRA, if you like, and the British government. And the, uh, in 1914, Connolly had said, if Ireland is partitioned, there will be a carnival of reaction that's what he called it. And we could see immediately following the Anglo-Irish Treaty in, nine, in December 21, uh, a whole section of people decided to go against it, occupied the four courts. 
And Michael Collins, who was the military leader of the, of the new provisional government, uh, sent requests for help to Winston Churchill uh, to look for military support to put down this uh, rebellion against the new state. And so we see what uh, the beginnings of what Connolly meant by a carnival of reaction and what we can think of as a counter revolution. The, the GPO was in bits so nobody could occupy it. So they occupied the anti-treaty forces, occupied the four courts and the began on June 22. After four days of shelling, the four courts surrendered, but not before blowing up much of the building which contained the public records office and irreplaceable documents if i refrain from congratulations it is only because i do not wish to embarrass you churchill wrote to collins his great mate the archives of the four courts may be scattered but the title deeds of ireland are safe in other words the property of the country is protected despite this transfer of power the government did nothing much about the four courts, sorry, excuse me, for the about the GPO. Nothing much could be done for some time. It lay in ruins, I believe, until 1924. But then the new government, coming together government, uh, set about greatly expanding and including the shopping mall. You know about all of this, you're studying this. And broadly speaking, you can see they saw it as a it was something that would be funding itself through rentals. Um, after 10 years, about thereabouts, the anti-treaty party came into power, um, led by de Valera, the only surviving leader of the rising. And one of the first acts was to buy this sculpture, which had already been uh, made by Oliver Shepherd, um, and to install it in the GPO. And there's no question, but the de Valera wanted to associate this religious iconography with the mythical, uh, wanted to, he wanted to be associated with this uh, idea of Ku Cullen, um, who had uh, defended until he was dead, defended Ulster. Of course, this was useful also because it tried to bring together the two sides. So Ku Cullen is uh, revered or mytho mythologized by both the unionist and the national sides in the north of Ireland. And in the 40s, the late 30s and 40s, increasingly de Valera started to use the GPO as the set for military parades. This is something the Common Gael government hadn't done. And the uh, reason is because when he got into power in 32, the anti-treaty forces, underground forces, the IRA, thought, great, this is, this is we're back in power. Uh, but de Valera had to put a stop to that very quickly because remember the title deeds of Ireland had to be protected. So de Valera uh, organized a vicious anti-IRA campaign, greatly strengthened the Offences Against the Person Act and used the GPO in its original uh, symbolism, if you like. And this leads us, oh yes, the final slide on this section is, um, the blowing up of Nelson's Pillar to celebrate 50th anniversary of the rising. So in, um, by the way, that was done probably in collusion with the Irish army. Um, so why did the GPO, why did the rebels pick the GPO as the headquarters? Well, shortly after the rising, the Times history of the war said that the building had not been badly chosen, seeing that the post office is, or rather was, an isolated, powerfully constructed stone building and commands the main street of the city. It was also the meeting place of the wires and cables that control electric communications all over Ireland and England. To understand this, you must understand the security apparatus of the British Empire at the time. In 1916, Britain controlled 25% of the world surface, mass, high point of, of the empire. But in 1812, the empire was facing a very grave threat outlined in red on this map called Napoleon, who thanks particularly to his marriage into the Austrian um, royal family, uh, now was in control of most of Europe. So the British were paranoid to say the least and regarded Ireland as a threat because it had been used for a flanking attack in the rebellion earlier, there had been landings of French, and so construction of Martello Towers and fortifications took place, and a system of giant set squares were going to be uh, erected across the country to convey messages from Galway to Dublin of a rising 20-foot-tall towers, 25 miles apart, 
actually based on a French model, um, but they were never done. In 1805, the British had achieved a great victory against the French and the Spanish at Trafalgar. Uh, and the hero of the day was commemorated in Dublin with the construction of Nelson's Pillar, which preceded the GPO. Um, the late 18th century, now some general slides about just the background of the architecture in Dublin at the time, you all know way more than I do, but the late 18th century architecture is the most spectacular legacy of government patronage during the period. Successive viceroys guided by Westminster's desire to win par parliamentary support of the administration actively encouraged the construction of ambitious public buildings. The British used architecture as an important political tool, a means of propaganda and of making power visible like Nelson's pillar, st staying current with the popular style reflected on the government's competency. So these buildings were built under the uh, guidance of an English architect, English architect, Scandon and uh, Thomas Cooley, in the, uh, if you like, leading official style, which some people call Franco-Roman classicism. However, the GPO was handed to an Irish architect. And this is going to address the question of what is in the architecture of the building, which might be considered nationalist and not imperialist. And to begin with, we might think about the architecture itself. Francis Johnson was Irish. Um, and it's said that the style that he used was different from the dominant style because he used what might be called a Greek revival style in contrast to the previous buildings. Uh, and that this would go on to become the style associated with Scottish nationalist uh, architecture in the 19th century. However, you might wonder whether this change in um, style was really, could really have caused anyone in the city uh, more than any, um, whatever, uh, to give pause to anyone, because really, what is the difference from most of our point of view? Nelson Good Good Goodman, uh, who's a great philosopher of these things, says that representation, exemplification, and expression are elementary varieties of symbolization in architecture, but reference by a building to abstruse or complicated ideas sometimes runs along more devious paths, along chains of elementary referential links. That's sorry, slightly complicated, but what he means is in the case that we're looking at, if uh, Francis Johnson used Greek revival, maybe we could say the Greek revival refers to um, the struggle of the Greeks against the Persian empire. And therefore it could be seen to be associated with anti-imperialism or even that Greek architecture could have some sort of radical uh, lack or a pre, it didn't suffer from the corruption of Roman imperialism. So therefore, in some way, by a kind of a chain of reference, this could be seen as, as nationalist. But Goodman's scheme of exemplification, which is architecture conveys meaning uh, by being an example, by illustration by example, uh, contains two parts, literal as well as metaphorical exemplification. And on the literal side of it, um, it is true that Johnston, who became disillusioned in his career as architect for the Board of Works uh, and concentrated more and more on artistic matters, he himself sponsored the Royal Albertian Academy in order to promote Irish artists. Uh, he also commissioned an Irish sculpture for the iconography on the GPO, uh, whose father, uh, Smith's father, had been, um, the job had been taken from him because he was Irish allegedly for the statues on the customs house. Um, but anyway, that's, if you like, at the level of metaphor and me the level of literal exemplification. But at another level, we can think of the GPO as being integrated into the life of Dublin and in that way to become uh, literally in some way, not so much anti-imperial, but not imperial, not fulfilling its original intention. So. This is Christy, this is Claire Wills in her book. For all its splendor, the GPO lacked the martial significance of Dublin Castle. She's talking about why didn't the rebels take the castle as their headquarters? It was a symbol of commercial rather than military power. And it had a very different standing with the Irish public. It was situated at the heart of the commercial district, yet surrounded by slums. It stood for control, but it was also where you bought your stamps. The building managed to function simultaneously as a symbol of empire and of a quotidian aspect of Dublin life. And this dual status, 
as linchpin in the presentation of the state where the British are Irish and at the same time owned by the ordinary citizen has marked the story of the GPO ever since. The ordinary citizen, I question in this because I believe that there are class issues which are really important. So we can see that the sense of this, 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 was, this wasn't unintended as far back as at least 1849, the authorities, the city council, the corporation rather, were used using the GPO as the site of a spectacle to drum up and to encourage support for the regime, for the, for the monarchy and for the administration in London. And this, of course, implies the existence of a public. The 1849 visit of Victorian Albert, the 1903 visit of Edward VII, in which the GPO becomes, if you like, the spectacle um, designed to whip up enthusiasm. At another level, uh, Nelson's pillar became famous as a place more or less anybody could go up and have a view from. And this engaged the public in another way. And I go to the famous essay about the Eiffel Tower. I, it's a bit of theory, but I just, it's years since I've looked at this, so I kind of really wanted to go back to it. That the tower by Barth transgresses the habitual divorce of seen and being seen. The world ordinarily produces either purely functional organisms, camera or I, intended to see things, but which then afford nothing to sight. This is the theme of the voyeur, or else spectacles which themselves are left in the pure passivity of the visible. The tower is a complete object which has, if one may say so, both sexes of sight. Another, another layer of this is that when the pillar was constructed, the street, Sackville Street, and the area was the most uh, you know, fantastic address, the most upper class posh address, if you like, in the city. But the active union began the process of the, uh, if you like, slumification of Dublin. Dublin became progressively poorer generally, and certainly this part of Dublin uh, descended into slums and into a site of uh, a world historical urban squalor. And uh, so the result, one of the results of this is, as Christie, as Claire Will says, that long before the rising O'Connell Street itself was a locus of, for nationalist protest. From the turn of the century, the urban landscape of Dublin had become intensely politicized. The unusual width of the street, busy with shoppers and travelers waiting for trams, offered maximum exposure to anyone seeking to draw attention to themselves. An ideal arena for home rule protests, Gaelic League demonstrations, labor agitation, housing campaigns. So nothing has changed. I have um, um, in my life spent many hours in under the portico of the GPO, making claims, um, perhaps not as absolute and grandiose as the proclamation of 1916, but always making claims and using the architecture, um, if you like, as a prop in order for this. So my conclusion, not doing too badly because all the technical hiccups, we're still doing a few questions if people have them. Uh, my conclusion is the most famous building, its fame was constructed intentionally part of the architecture and infrastructure of empire. But unlike such structures as the customs house and forecourts, it was democratized literally and possibly, I mean, possibly if we take the Greek revival ar argument symbolically from the start for a brief period nationally. And since then, from the perspective of people of no property, and this is where I question Claire Wills talking about ordinary citizens. I think there's a big difference in the way the building is viewed, depending on whether you have or you have not property. It became a symbol of anti-imperialism, but for this to work, it had to be set alight. So the, the image of the building in flames and with the imagery of the phoenix rising from the flames has become a symbol of revolution um, in this country and remains so, but exists uneasily. Okay, this is uh, one more quote from Barthes. The Barth, the tower attracts meaning the way a lightning rod attracts thunderbolts. For all lovers of signification, it plays a glamorous part, that of pure signifier. This was uh, the old world of sem sem semiology, semiotics. Um, it plays a glamorous part, that of pure signifier, i.e. of a form in which men unceasingly put meaning, which they extract from their knowledge, their dreams, their history, without this meaning thereby ever being finite or fixed. Who can say what the tower will be for humanity tomorrow? The GPO, meanwhile, is used uh, again after a brief period during the troubles, ninth, late 60s through to the 90s, when there weren't any marches outside the GPO because the state didn't want to remind 
certain people of the revolutionary tradition. It is now once again, uh, if you like, brought back into the mainstream iconography of the state. Um, however, there are people amongst us at the highest levels who still show certain signs of anti-imperialism. The president refused to go to commemorate partition uh, in the company of HM, Queen, um, Private Eye or Phoenix um, did this cover on the subject. And one of the main critics of Higgins, the president, was John Bruton, who is an avowed continuing supporter of John Redmond and says that the rising was a terrible disaster. Home rule was about to be granted. It was an unnecessary waste of life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The truth about it matter is that these people are imperialists at heart. The Brexit shows that there was no loyalty to British imperialism, but some decades ago, uh, the ruling elites of this country pivoted very, very quickly to American uh, imperialism. This is from just from last December. Um, the country remains uh, in, uh, in the service of international uh, capital and when and if in our time the American empire comes a cropper like previous ones, uh, no doubt unless we the people uh, rise up, there will be yet another pivot to yet another form of empire. That is it. What about that? What about that, Mark? Great, a call to revolution. <laughs> you knew I had to get in some stuff about the- uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> politics at the end of it. But yeah, but actually, I mean, among other things, I think it, it was also um, just a great um, journey through- Spectacular, super. Oh, I like that. Whoever said spectacular, I'm yeah. going to ask you again for your opinion shortly. I have I'm going to get uh, getting more responses in now. So I'm going to open up for questions, probably easiest if they go into the chat. Ellen is not that. Sorry, the timing here is bad because of all those technical sites. Yeah. I could have timed it better. About five or 10 minutes, I think. I think that's OK. Uh, if people want to uh, leave, of course, they may. But if you want to stay on, um, the, I'm sure there's time for a few questions. Mark, one uh, question. I, I'm going to let you just absorb things that are coming in from the chat. But Ellen is just as a comment there. but just. Your your thing about um well just picking up on the this the Barth thing about you know the the vessel for meaning the the signifier the building as a signifier and it, yeah. it's free to be adopted and will continue to be um I'm just I suppose it's a question that about that thing of to what extent people think or that is thought about consciously in other words the symbolic dimension let's say of the thing as opposed to or or alongside its many let's say strategic or situational advantages i.e wider street in the city portico um transport was a transport hub you know the many reasons why people would gather there it's is it that it is it that it just at what point <laughs> do those two things align if you know what i mean is it just happy accident that we've got this um, perfect alignment of a situation and a symbolic um potential that's yeah, not a good... I, I think when we see how um the, at the royal visit in 1849 how the gpo was used with the pillar i think the pillar was essential to the whole thing and again in 1903 you can yeah. see that the authorities were consciously using the gpo as a back a backdrop as a stage set yeah. for um certain kinds of events and they are again and what happened was it was set alight at some point in the middle which meant that this is where it became a pure signifier where the original intention of what it meant the people lost control of that if you like the rule the rulers lost control of that and it started to become um taken over and now it, it's, it was used, as Claire Will says, before the rising as a site of protest. It continues to be used as a site of protest. Um, and that's what's significant about it. It's that people feel that this is a framework within which they can make claims, claims on identity and claims on power. So it's, uh, it really is a pot potent yeah. um, symbol as, of, of a building. And it's a mixture of all those things that it's hard to say where what comes and goes. I think the security and the communications. I didn't touch on the fact that there was a telegraphs office on the first floor yeah. and 
they all that happened was when they went in, in fact, O'Reilly was involved in breaking through into it, the, the, the telegraph operators ran out and ran down to Amiens Street and immediately started telegraphing London and, and Kingston to say that there was something wrong. Yeah. Um, and that they couldn't get the machinery working in the GPO. So they went over to the wireless school across uh, Connell Street, above Race's shop, and spent most of the week trying to get the wirelesses working to send out various bulletins. But it was, they were pretty ineffectual at using this apparatus. Um, it certainly wasn't yeah. uh, anything like that. No. But that, it is interesting that one of the reasons, I presume, another reason why they would have gone for the GPO rather than the castle is because it's easier to take over the GPO than the castle by far. I mean, it's not a heavily, a he wasn't a heavily, let's say, defended uh, yeah, yeah. in the same way that the castle would be, and because it's not as overt a symbol of, yeah, or not, 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 it's actually not just a symbol, but it's not as overt a uh, stronghold, let's say, of, of empire as the castle would have been. And yet, <laughs> It's because it's invisible in the city, and um, it's uh, we'd, we'd entered into the, L, the, the 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 era of spectacles. The nineteenth century was the the age of public man. We'd entered into this era of of imagery, and, and the castle wouldn't have worked. It was hidden away. Because oddly, even though it was the most um, what would you say evident <laughs> presence of empire, it was also kind of hidden away. Yeah, and actually, the first death occurred outside the castle. The policeman was shot. Um, yeah. And it wouldn't have been that difficult to say because the officers were away to a large extent at the races. So it wasn't of that interest to the rebels because they were all modern people who knew that the value of image. And it's the reading of the proclamation under the portico that it tells it all. Yeah. And there was apparently a small um, group of people hanging around had a clue what was going on. Uh, but during the week, uh, by all accounts, people started to come down the street to read this thing. That idea of the building, the word, the declaration. Today, these things exist still, but in maybe different forms. And can they? Will they be associated with places? I suspect they will. I suspect there will always be, uh, if you like, a Tahrir Square or a, you know, a, a, a place where, which becomes associated with uh, yeah. revolution. Well, I mean, it's interesting that like, where was I reading it recently? Um, can't remember one. One reading we were doing in a seminar was talking about the, the the continuing power of occupy of to occupy. You know that yeah 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 that is still uh, an act that needs to happen in some way. You know what I mean? The power continues to be spatial, and the occupation of space continues to be uh, evidence of a kind of power. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the that began with the reclaiming the streets. When that kind of says it too, yeah. that, that who, you know we reclaiming the streets from who. And the problem with liberal democracy is it needs, it, as opposed to repressive authoritarianism, liberal democracy needs the public to be involved in this project. It requires the participation of the people to activate these spaces and to keep these things going. Um, but that always contains within it the danger uh, of dissidents and the danger of things not going according to plan. Um, as Kieran Allen in his book points out, the, one of the groups that drove the rising and the revolution were the disaffected lower intelligentsia, people like Pierce, uh, who, were, who were barred, whose ways were barred within the administration. In the same way that Francis Johnson was clearly exercised by the fact that Irish yeah. artists were prevented from moving up by the imperial administration. Because, of course, any uh, government is always going to be dispensing favours. So... Presumably favours were being dispensed in London to these plum positions. And so that creates a lot of resentment and, and, and kind of an energy which will burst through. I'm not careful. Yeah, I, I liked the way you, you what, what, what's the way? You, you sort of brought Francis Johnson into the cause along the way, which is great, via the statue. Well, the Greek, uh, the Greek revival thing. I'm just not sure about all that, but I think it might be in there. I think um, uh, Nelson Goodman is literal and metaphorical exemplification. So I think we have to consider architecture as working on all of these levels of, of uh, coded messages that only the intelligentsia, the culture elites, can understand. But working together with uh, the fact that you can buy your stamps or the, that you can go up into the tower or whatever. But it's also it is that that the the twin like well maybe three things that happen in O'Connell Street and environs the the GPO the tower the column and the pro cathedral are interesting you know within about ten years of each other I guess ten to fifteen oh. after the Act of Union all of them as as it starts to be opened up to the 
to the river, the bottom of the street, you know. And it becomes surrounded by slums at the same time during this period. So yeah. it stops being, it becomes kind of dem democratic in that way because, and during the rising, there are accounts of how the rebels cordoned off a section of the street, which local, really, really poor, dispossessed people respected this. And there's a story, uh, the first day of the rising, some of the British were Lancers were shot coming down on horses. And this is a well-known story, which keeps getting repeated, of a local kid grabbing the guns, a gun off one of the, the dead soldiers and running up to the GPO and throwing it in the window and saying, there you go. Um, but there were locals too, who were very against the rising and um, particularly widow, widows or wives of soldiers who were getting an allowance and they thought that this has been a terrible betrayal. Mm -hmm. But the main people against the rising were the, you know, the Protestant elites, the Trinity College officers, and um, the people of Dublin were ambivalent. James Stevens is brilliant on this. People of Dublin had lots of gossip during the week of the rising, but no one was prepared to come down and say whose side they were on. They were like Talleyrand, who, when at dinner in Paris during one of the revolts, somebody said, who, which side is winning? He says, I don't know yet. You know, well, oh, which side are you on? And he said, I'll wait till tomorrow to see, to see who's won. So the people of Dublin were just like Talleyrand. They were waiting to see who, was, who would win before deciding what side they were on. But then, of course, even after that, it would have been post the executions that really shifted the perception of it, I think. You know what I mean? Or shifted sympathies. So, well, that yeah, the executions what sealed it. Um, but then the civil war complicated. And Ellen says the Garden of Remembrance as a sunken void to counterweight the, yeah. the, uh, the to counterweight Point Nelson's Pillar Garden opens in yeah. April 1966 while Pillar is blown up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many houses go from one to the other, which is interesting, you know, the the typical um the, the typical route of of a march would often be from garden of remembrance down to the gpo absolutely and uh, just on the blowing up of nelson's column another i have all these gossip stories as you do at this age where somebody ira person well somebody who claimed to be uh who said years ago that when the ira blew up nelson's column it was an absolutely brilliant blowing up job for people for connoisseurs of blowing up jobs apparently it was Brilliant. Uh, no damage apart from the tower itself. Um, but when the Irish army went in um, to finish the job off uh, the next week, it was a complete mess. Every window was blown out all over the city. And uh, so this was, this was uh, one of the stories I heard. And um, yeah, the story about Nelson's head and Arahali stopping and firing shots at it is probably just made up. Again, Max Caulfield, it's, if that isn't what happened in the Rising, it's what should have happened. It, it should be, history should be fun. It does make me think of that, like that, I mean, we should wrap up, I guess, but just, it is striking that you sort of begin to, it is one of those events that you feel would have had to have been invented if it didn't happen, actually, you know, in a way that it's a sort of, it's such a fulcrum point in in our history and i guess every every history has it has those and you wonder it's an odd thing to think about a counter history where it didn't happen before the well old. this is something we think about all the time and the more i read about this because i had to reread lots of stuff to do this i the more i became convinced that um at some level people sensed it was now or never and there was that idea that they thought the war would be over at christmas so they had to get the, get at the brits before the war ended but there was a deeper sense that this was going to be the last fling of the great movement and that if they didn't do it, things would just peter out. And I think they were probably right. It, because in some ways it was the end of the old, not just the old style of empire, but the old style of rebellion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, there's lots more we could talk about that for another hour. You have to come back and do a part two, Mark. Um, and we'll get Dermot Ferreter on with you and you can discuss everything. Um, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. That was a great talk. A lot of thing, a lot of positive comments coming in on the chat. Um, and I think that will be, we've recorded it, so we'll be going up on YouTube. We'll try to edit out all the little glitches along the way, but we'll keep all the good stuff, including um, your grandfather's letter, which is amazing to see. Uh, bullet holes and all. Although it looked like there was one bullet hole in the front of the letter and two bullet holes in the back. Which is kind of an interesting. Yeah, so again, we have to question some of this material, but um, anyway, there you go. 
No, it was good. It was great, great, great. Okay, thanks a million, Mark, and thank you to everybody for coming on. And keep uh, keep an eye on the the Instagram account and so on that we've shared for for news of the next one. Don't quite know when that'll happen yet. It'll be next week, I think. But hope to see everybody on there. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks you, and thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic. Bye, 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 bye.